What I want to do is talk about research and talk about the future. And Rich Carnival already alluded to the fact, <coughs> excuse me, that we do need to develop new strategies to address this issue of uh, antibiotic resistance. So all of you know that there's really not a week that goes by where we see some propaganda in the, in the news media where there's um, calls for restrictions on the use of antibiotics. Here's one article that came out saying that the poll says, says that Americans want antibiotic-free meat. Uh, the New York Times, farm use of antibiotics defies scrutiny. Food safety news, farmers should rein in antibiotic use worldwide. And the Washington Post, resistance to antibiotics is becoming a crisis. In reality, though, we know, as has, I'm sure, been explained many times in the last couple of days, antibiotics has historically been critical to animal health, not only for um, the treatment of animal diseases, uh, disease prevention, uh, metaphylactic use um, in the face of disease outbreaks, and, yes, historically, uh, growth promotion. But regardless of your opinion, it's inevitable that either for regulatory reasons um, or because simply some of these antibiotics are no longer effective, we really need to look at alternative strategies to conventional antibiotic use. Now, our goal, as you know, we need medical interventions to improve not only animal health, animal welfare, and production efficiency. Now, what I want to do in terms of looking into the future, I want to share with you a project or a symposium that we recently organized this last September with the OIE, where we essentially organized a conference on alternatives to antibiotics to really look at what is in the pipeline is, and is there anything that we can do to actually enhance the development of these alternative to antibiotic strategies. This symposium that was organized with the help of literally hundreds of people gathered some 300 researchers, scientists, people from the pharmaceutical industry, regulators from Asia, Australia, South America. And the idea was to bring all these people together and ask some fundamental questions around three key issues. Number one is to highlight promising research results and novel technologies that provide alternatives to antibiotics and importantly assess challenges associated with their commercialization and use. And lastly, provide actionable strategies to support de their development. Now, as I mentioned, we just had this symposium and the scientific committee is still in the process of assessing all of this information. And actually the amount of data the number of products that are currently in use or in the pipeline is actually, actually tremendous and it's quite a task. So what I, I want to do is there's no way that I can do justice to all of the products that are promising, but I just want to give you an overall view and a feel for what the future entails and the importance of, of research. The symposium was organized around five major topics. One was alternatives to antibiotics lessons from nature. Second, to look at immune modulation approaches. Third, to look at the gut microbiome. Four, alternatives to antibiotics for growth promotion. And lastly, and importantly, regulatory pathways to enable the licensing of alternatives to antibiotics. So before I start, you know, what are these alternatives to antibiotics? Well, they're drugs, biologics, biotherapeutics, and feed additives. And I want to list some of the products that were actually discussed at this symposium. And when I read these products, I want you to think about those issues that Car Rich Carnival discussed in his presentation about why we need these products and how they can be used. But some of these products that are, quote, alternatives to antibiotics include host-derived antimicrobials, defensives, probiotics and prebiotics that we know well, bactericins, phytochemicals, acidifying agents, heavy metals, bacteriophages, bacteriophage lysins, 
small interfering RNAs, naturally occurring antibacterialytic enzymes, recombinant and hyperimmune therapeutic antibodies, immune enhancers, toll-like receptor agonists, and of course, cytokines. So if you look at the opportunities before us in terms of finding new products to treat and prevent animal diseases, it's quite extensive. And some of those you, of course, have recognized and have been around for a long time, but others are fairly new and novel. So let me just focus on the first session, which was looking at what are those alternatives to antibiotics lessons from nature. And the aim of this particular session was to review novel biocontrol approaches for preventing and or treating bacterial pathogens, and where applicable, also viral and parasitic pathogens in food animal production. So I'm just going to give you a few examples, because there's no way I can cover this in, in the 15 minutes that I have left. But essentially, in regard to host-derived antimicrobials, the so-called innate def host defense mechanism, as we all know, we have uh, cellular defenses that involves neutrophils, macrophage, uh, natural killer cells. But importantly, we know that <clears throat> the host actually produce, produces effective molecules, such as enzymes, host defense peptides, and collectins. And actually, those are present in all organisms, and many of them are actually ancients. A a ancients. They're found in snakes, frog, and insect. They have a limited repertoire of molecules. They are rapid acting. They have broad specificity. And importantly, they're constitutive and stimulated secretion. And that's really very important because these host antimicrobials actually then could somehow be induced by a product or through genetic selection may be enhanced in some of our animal uh, farm animals. So just looking at one of them, uh, this chicken catholicidin 2 uh, from uh, chicken is a 26 amino acid uh, molecule, cationic, amphipathic, meaning that is both hydrophilic and lipophilic on, on both ends. And to, uh, to, to look at its expression, it's actually produced specifically by heterophils in birds, that's the uh, equivalent of neutrophils in mammalian cells. And providing some of the information in terms of the science and what these molecules, that particular molecule does, has been demonstrated that with Salmonella and Ritidus infections of chickens, it results, results in the accumulation of Cat2 positive heterophils at the site of infection. This Cat2 is a microbicidal against gram negative, gram positive bacteria, yeast and fungi, uh, can be truncated Analogs have, have shown antimicrobial activity as well. Cat2 and derived peptides induce cytokine production in chicken microphage cell lines. And this is very interesting because a lot of these molecules actually have an impact on the immune system, in addition to having a very specific antimicrobial effect. Um, these Cat2 dampen LPS, induce inflammatory responses, and the prophylactic or therapeutic treatment of chickens with Cat2 Two, significantly reduces salmonella survival in the crop. So, you know, there are some of these molecules with very specific and promising antibacterial activity. Now, let's move on to bacteriophage. As you know, they're viruses of bacteria, and what's important is they're very specific. And actually, um, when we look in other countries like Asia, a lot of these products are actually available uh, in feeds and are being sold by feed companies. Now, what's interesting about bacteriophage is they were first discovered by Felix Durrell while he was working at the Pasteur, Pasteur Institute in 1917. They infect and replicate in bacterial cells. Um, they have, you know, host-specific in infections. They must enter and exit, exit the bacterial host cell. They go through what's called a lytic or lysogenic cycle, you find DNA phages, RNA phages, envelope. In fact, bacteriophage viruses are probably one of the pro most prominent biomolecules, biomolecules molecules that we have in the biosphere. Now, can they be used, you know, as an invention? And way back in 1919, Phyllis Durrell 
explore the use of FOSH solutions to treat dysentery in humans. FOSH solutions were supplied to the Russian soldiers during World War II. This is the same period that ARS and Pfizer were looking at fermentation processes to make available the use of penicillin for D-Day for our troops, but the Russians were looking at the use of bacteriophage. It's been used in the Republic of Georgia since the 1940s, and recently, starting in 2006, the U.S. The FDA approved uh, Listeria Fosh solution for using in ready-to-eat meat and poultry, and again in 2011 for E. coli. And there's some research right now that's looking at bacteriophage as a potential um, intervention for these multi-drug resistant strain bacteria where there may not be any other uh, intervention to treat those uh, diseases. But there there's, are a lot of concerns with these bacteriophage. And like in nature and science, that's always inevitable. But, you know, there is, you know, restriction modification or degradation of phage DNA when they enter bacterial cells. You have these CRISPRs. This is very interesting, but who would have known that bacteria actually have an immune system with memory? Those are the equivalent of using these interfering RNAs in mammalian cells. You have potential problems with immunogenicity, right? If you inject them in an animal, you may get antibody uh, response to these phages. You have resistance through mutations in bacterial genes needed for absorption and lysogeny. And importantly, a lot of virulence factors, in fact, are, um, are distributed through lateral gene transfer. So what the scientific community is really looking at is, even though these bacteriophages, you know, may be a solution, what's probably more important is to actually look at bacteriophage gene products. So looking at phage genomics and proteomics and searching for potential novel antimicrobials. So... Uh, some of those include bactericins that have been shown to reduce Campylobacter. And you have uh, all sorts of bacteriophage lytic enzymes, such as amidases and miraminidase and endopeptidases. And, and the this, this science right now in the scientific community is actually making some of these recombinant lytic enzymes, such as amidase, and have shown that those, in fact, can be lytic against uh, organisms such as Clostridium perfringens which is one of the cause of necrotic antiriasis in poultry and very important. The challenge, of course, is that you need efficient and cost-effective expression system. So as we're identifying these new molecules, either whether they host antimicrobials or some of these new enzymes that are available from bacteriophages, you know, that's going to be one of the key determinants. How can we produce them in an efficient manner? Some of the conclusions from this first session were, you know, at the end of the day, we need to define the mechanisms of action. We need to conduct scientific studies to determine their efficacy and their safety. We need to conduct studies on their field conditions. And importantly, we need to determine their, po their product profile. Are they going to be for treatment, prevention, or growth promotion? And as I just mentioned, can these, can these be produced and manufactured in a cost-effective ma manner? And how will they be administered? Moving on to session two, we looked at immune modulation approaches to enhance disease resistance and treat animal infections. Actually, this is very critical because throughout this symposium, when we looked at every one of these sessions and the inventions, this issue of immune mod mod modulation seems to cross talk across all of these uh, these potential products. And the aim of this session was to address novel drug-free alternative strategies to enhance innate defense mechanisms by modulation of innate immune pathways or activ activation of conserved innate immune sensing molecules of the host immune system. Just to give you a feel for what I'm referring to, I don't want to give you a, a whole big lecture on innate defense mechanisms, but we know that we have these rec recognition patterns, receptors, or better known as pattern recognition receptors, that stimulate the immune response. Some of them uh, you've heard recently, some findings around toll-like receptors, uh, knob-like receptors, and uh, retinoic acid receptors. And 
there's evidence now that plants, phytochemicals, essential oils, um, phytonutrients such as safflower leaves, plum, mushrooms, capsaicin, salmonaldehyde, garlic, actually enhance innate immunity. Right? We've known that for a long time. You know that the Chinese in Asia actually pay a lot of attention to these you know, medicines, these herbal medicines. Question, are they real? What do they do? Well, now and today, you know, with all the research tools that we have, we can actually find that some of these phytochemicals actually interact with these PRRs. And importantly, they provide opportunities where downstream signaling components provide molecular targets for some of these dietary interventions. And so throughout the symposium, there was a tremendous amount of data provided on the activity of these phytochemicals. And of course, with research now to back up, you know, their specific mechanisms of action, uh, determining in, uh, doses, and looking specifically what they might do in terms of enhancing uh, the innate in, uh, defense mechanism, our level of disease resistance, or having specific antibacterial activity. The uh, future looks very promising. And also promising, I talked about cross-cut in terms of immunology, but there's this whole area of, of nutrigenomics, whereby now we're using the microarray technologies, looking again at some of these phytochemicals, we can actually ask what genes are being upregulated or downregulated compared to certain pathogens and again, providing pathways and targets for new molecules. Some of the conclusions from session two was that today it's still amazing that we know very little about uh, avian or, or swine or, or bovine immunology. And in a large part, it's because we're still m missing a lot of these immunological reagents. And it's really sad to say this in the 21st century, but this is an investment that we must make to better understand immune functions in our livestock species. Also critical is going to be what is going to be the product claim for these products. Again, is it going to be for treatment, prevention, or increasing disease resistance? At the end, it was definitely determined that more basic research is needed. Session three focused on this really fascinating area that you've all heard in, about in the news now, which is the gut microbiome, and it's, a, it's an involvement in immune development, health, and disease. And the, um, you know, you, you've, you've read in the literature, both scientific and the popular press, that there's many advances that have been made now shown that the microbiota plays a key role in health and disease in humans and in animals as well. So the aim of this session was to attempt to capture state-of-the-art results inform animals and humans to assess how microbiome analysis is helping to solve disease problems. And yes, today we have new tools and the ability to do some very fast and efficient sequencing. And uh, through what's called metagenomic analysis, we can actually take samples from the gut and look at the RNA, the transcriptome, the, the DNA, and actually start to look at identifying and trying to determine what are the bacterial species and other organisms that are in the gut? So in the gut, these data and these studies are telling us that we're finding bacteria, fungi, viruses, protozoa, helminth, and the amount of bacteria is really enormous. And what they're trying to do is, interestingly, even though we can grow 90% of these organisms in vitro, they've been able to essentially classify them in these uh, families of bacteria, such as firm Firmicutes and Bacteroides and Proteobacteria. And what they're doing is actually conducting studies to determine, to determine the shift in these population and trying to associate this with an effect, either positive or negative, such as rumen acid acidosis, uh, in infections, improvement in feed efficiency, et cetera. A lot of these bacteria, these commensal bacteria in the gut are associated with mucus and micromolecule food matrix, and their composition varies, both in different portions of the GI tract, and they are different in animals. So alternatives to antibiotics to modify microbiomes actually probably will have two main impact, one in the science of nutrition, improved feed efficiency, improved growth rates, 
assess alternative feeds, and importantly, in terms of the science of disease, prevent intestinal disease, reduce inflammation, prevent colonization of foodborne pathogens, reduce shed shedding of these pathogens, and even increase disease resistance. Some of the conclusions from that session were that a number of products that were discussed actually impact the gut microbiome. The question was asked, do we actually need to culture and characterize the gut microbiome, or will just identifying what is in the gut microbiome through metagenomics be sufficient? Do we need to shift specific populations that are associated with bacterial effect, or do we actually need to understand the mechanisms of actions that are associated and try to characterize those mechanisms in which the gut modulates disease and health traits? And importantly, we need to integrate, obviously, nutrition, health, and disease research. Session four looked at the use of alternative antibiotics to promote growth in livestock, poultry, and even agriculture production. And the aim of the session was to explore novel approaches that can be used as alternatives to growth promoters in poultry, swine, ruminants, and agriculture. A key aim was to improve knowledge on mechanisms of action in the growth promoting characteristics of proposed pro approaches. I, I don't have the time to give you examples, but we had numerous presentations, one of which was uh, from Sergio Calsap Maglia from Spain, who talked about alternatives to, of use of antibodies for growth promoters in ruminants. We had other scientists from Australia talk about the intestinal microbiota association with high feed conversion efficiency in chickens. An enormous amount of data were provided. By the way, all of this information, the presentation, some over 100 abstracts, and some over 60 posters are provided on the website for the symposium and are currently available for you to review. Some of the conclusions for this session was that we really need to understand, again, mechanisms of action to maximize the effect of alternatives to antibiotics for growth promotion. The active ingredients need to be defined to ensure quality and reproducibility of expected effect of the product under field condition. And current knowledge of mechanisms of action for growth promotion of certain alternatives to antibiotics actually may be greater than what we knew about antibiotics and how they promoted uh, growth promotion. Lastly and importantly was session five, and this was really critical because it dealt with regulatory pathways to enable the licensing of alternatives to antibodies. The aim, obviously, was to review those pathways, not only in the U.S. and Europe, but as well as in Asia, China, Korea, et cetera. And what we did is we had key regulators, from like Steve Vaughn from the FDA, actually describe what is in place to actually enable the development of these alternatives to antibiotics, as well as David McKay, McKay from uh, the EMEA and other regulators from China. And we also included industry to tell us what were their perspective in terms of the challenges that they face in the development of these alternatives to antibiotics. And also, interestingly, uh, especially in Europe, where there's just an effort to limit the use of antibiotics, uh, companies now are seeking claims for products to actually reduce the use of antibiotics, such as if you use this vaccine and this efficacy is such in the porcine respiratory disease complex, will that actually result in a reduction in the use of antibiotics? Some of the key conclusions from that session were that alternative to antibiotics will be regulated as drugs, biologics, or feed additives, or possibly all the others above. Alternatives to antibiotics must be developed according to national and international standards and meet requirements of efficacy, safety, and quality. Regulatory processes are in place to enable and facilitate the licensing of alternative to antibiotics. And that was very important. Some changes have been made to actually try to do better than we have in the past to try to accommodate the licensing and commercialization of these products. And we need to engage regulatory agencies early in the process. This is a key take-home message that was delivered by all these uh, regulatory agencies, and that was certainly universal from all the regulatory agencies that were represented against from many diverse countries across the world. So going forward, we really need, if you think about it, to move this field forward 
Uh, as Ridge Carnival said in his presentation, and as I'm trying to convey to you now, a lot of emphasis has been placed on monitoring antibiotic resistance. But, you know, that, that, that is fine and that's going to continue to be important. But what we really need is solutions. And we really need new antimicrobials. We really need new strategies, new alternatives to antibiotics. And in order to achieve that, we really need to link academia, government researchers, the feed industry, the pharmaceutical industry, regulatory agencies, and of course the livestock and poultry and agriculture industries. And stakeholders in scientific community really are going to need to define the scope of the research, development, and applications of alternative antibodies because as you saw, it's so broad and there's so many products. So we're going to have to home in and strategize and look at priorities and that's going to be important to get that input from our stakeholders in the scientific community. I want to close by saying that the OIE, I think that may have been presented, I don't know, but the OIE March 2013 is going to put together a very important symposium which is labeled an OIE global conference on the responsible and prudent use of antimicrobial agents for animals because they also recognize the importance of addressing this issue as we need to actually grow animal production worldwide with the growth of the human population predicted now to be, I believe, over 9 billion by the year 2045. And if you go to their website, you'll see that they have very specific objectives. And I know you can't read that probably, but the last one is actually for, for the symposium on alternative antibodies to come forth and identify, you know, what are some of the key molecules that are the most promising and ready to be developed so that they will be available hopefully as soon as possible for use in our food animals.